I don't think it's any secret that in our culture today, marriage is a very contentious issue where there are a lot of differing views. It's a, a, a subject on which our society's views have shifted quite a bit. Just a few generations ago, marriage was considered to be between a man and a woman for life. Today, it's, as far as culture is concerned, it's really kind of open for whoever to define it in whatever way they choose to define it. Culture says that it's no big deal. The views have shifted, and I was listening to the radio not too long ago, and I even heard an ad that came on, and I was just blown away because it was an ad for hassle-free divorces. You don't want to go to court. Just come here. Nobody's, nobody's fighting or upset. We'll just, we'll just do this quick and easy, no big deal. We'll get it over with. And it'll cost you less. We live in a culture in which, I'm kind of blown away by this one, but divorce parties are an actual thing. And if you don't believe me, there's a page on Wikipedia that will explain all about it. There are books that have been written about it. Marriage is, within our culture, is anything but what God's Word says they ought to be. Now before we launch into this this sermon, I do want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. This is a, uh, a subject that is debated on a number of uh, religiously in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a difficult and debated subject. And so we'll just start off by saying I'm not the authority on the matter. We're going to look at God's Word, which is the authority on the matter. And as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus continues this section in which He's going through different understandings from the law of Moses, because if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 20, that unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes into the different sections in chapter 5 where he's explaining very specific issues where the scribes and Pharisees were anything but righteous. They were anything but conforming to the ways of God. He talked about how murder begins in the heart with anger and contempt, how adultery begins in the heart with lust. And in this case, Jesus is talking about a subject that was debated among the scholars at that time, debated among the religious people of that time. The Jewish tradition was, there was quite a bit of debate, as I mentioned. But I want us to turn over to Matthew chapter 19 as well. And we're going to look there in verses 3 through 9, as Jesus will make some of the same points, but we see a fuller discussion on this subject from Jesus in this text. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing Him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? He answered and said, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now the Jewish tradition on this, as well as debate, the culture, within Jewish culture, divorce was the right of the men only. The Jewish historian Josephus comments to the effect that the woman was not allowed to divorce her husband within that culture. And if she wanted to, she had to convince him to be the one to legally go through with it. And there was a debate among Jewish theologians, among the Jewish scholars at the time, about what were the proper grounds for divorce. And this is what they're trying to draw Jesus into in Matthew 19. One group said that the only grounds would be for sexual immorality. Another, and the more popular view, was that for any grounds whatsoever, even for trivial matters, well, I'm upset because she burned my dinner. And it got pretty trivial about the reasons that they would, or relating to the previous section in the Sermon on the Mount, infatuation with another woman. 
It makes sense that this section follows the section where he talks about lust in the heart is where adultery begins. And our society does very much the same, treating marriage as trivial. You take a look at the way the definition of what marriage even is has changed over time in our society. Now God's word is still consistent about what marriage is. But our society is anything but consistent. And in Matthew chapter 19, we see in the sermon Jesus is, is speaking about that in Matthew 5 and 31 and 32. In Matthew 19, the Jews are trying to drag Jesus into this debate. What do you say about this? To try to entrap him by getting him to say something that might not be popular or get him worked into this debate where this is what he's focused on. Like many of the other times whenever they approach Jesus with a question, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? They're very likely looking for a way to entrap him. And we see Jesus goes around the question altogether as far as the way that he deals with it. Now before we get to where he's really focusing his answer and what he's really looking to, to deal with, I want to look at one thing that he does mention there as they, they press him on the issue of divorce is really what they're trying to get him to, to comment on. And he says in both of these texts, he talks about one grounds there for sexual immorality. Whenever a covenant is broken, and he says in, in Matthew 19, verses 7 through 9, and it's similar to what we see in, in Matthew 5, 31 and 32. He says, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not, it's not been this way. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. A concession was made because of a broken covenant. It was permitted. But notice whenever Jesus is asked this, as they're pressing him on this subject, they ask him to begin with, what are the grounds? And Jesus gives an answer to the question that doesn't really, it's not what they were wanting. <coughs> and so they ask him again, trying to bring him back to this issue of, well, but what about the divorce issue? And they ask him specifically, and notice the way that it's worded in verses 7 and 8. Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted. They're addressing it as though it's a command, and Moses said, or Jesus said, no, this was a concession. Because of hard hearts, there was permission given, but it's not what was preferred. It's not what, was, what God was intending. It's not what He wants. He only mentions the provision because they specifically press him on the issue of divorce. Jesus only deals with the divorce question when he is pressed, and he does not get into all of the what ifs. You know, and as we consider all of the messy situations that we can get into in our society, there are a lot of what ifs that we can bring up. What if this? What if that? And Jesus doesn't deal with all of those. And, and just to be upfront, we're not going to this morning either. We're going to look mainly at what was Jesus purpose or what was his desired answer. But as he considers the question of divorce, he says, from the beginning it's not been this way. And if you look back in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, we see one of the things that God had an issue with with his people in this book is that they weren't treating their marriages as God wanted them to. There's a number of things that, that the Israelites or that the Jews are rebuked for in, uh, in the book of Malachi. And this is just one of them in that list. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, he says, This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Against whom, you have dealt, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. But, but what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed uh, <clears throat> then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. And notice verse 16, he says, Therefore I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts, 
So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Notice again, verse 16, he says, For I hate divorce. That's never been God's desire. Whenever the Jews came to him and they asked him, Why did Moses command a certificate? Jesus said, No, no, it was because of hard hearts that Moses permitted. It was never the preferred option. And when we consider God and his character, We see God's people are pictured throughout Scripture, whether we're talking about Old Testament Israel or the church in the New Testament. God's people are pictured as His bride. And as the northern tribes were just on the verge of going (coughs) into captivity in Assyria, God sends them a prophet, Hosea, and very vividly illustrates His relationship with the Israelites. He tells Hosea, It gives him what I can only imagine had to be probably the hardest command that's been given to somebody in Scripture when he says, I want you to go find a wife of harlotry, a wife from that type of lifestyle, and marry her. And when the inevitable happens, when she runs around on him, he continues to be faithful to her. And when she finally ups and leaves a little bit later, Hosea chapter 3, God tells Hosea, go get her and bring her back. After she has continually been unfaithful. And that's a picture of God and His relationship with His people. That through all of the unfaithfulness, God has continued to be patient and has continued to forgive and has continued to be ready to accept His people back. And then in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. He continued to be patient because he did not want to put his people away. And whenever Jesus was pressed on the issue, he said, here's the grounds by which there is permission. But when we consider what Jesus is really wanting to get at, when he talks about the issue of marriage, he's not wanting to get into all the what ifs, where are the the concessions made for there to be a broken covenant where he really tries to focus his attention on what is God's design for marriage? What does he want it to be to begin with? And we see that coming through in both of these passages that God's desire is for permanence in marriage. This is what Jesus' real focus is, where his real desire is in speaking this in our text. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Well, that's the Jewish tradition and their interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24. But Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity or sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The goal is for there to not be a separation. And when you get to Matthew chapter 19, whenever the Jews are pressing Jesus on the issue, what are the grounds for it? Jesus doesn't immediately jump off and say, okay, well, here they are. He says, haven't you read? And he quotes in this section, haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus doesn't get into what are the concessions. What did Moses permit? Not, from the, not when he begins to answer that question. He says, I want to talk about what does God intend for this relationship? He wants to speak about the sanctity of marriage. That it's a lifelong relationship that it's to be one man and one woman for life. It's not a relationship or a covenant that's designed to be broken. It's not a relationship where there is a design for separation. He quotes from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 in the garden. From the very beginning, God created marriage to be a permanent relationship between two people that become one. And he says there, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Divorce undoes what God has done. But as we consider God's design for marriage, probably one of the best passages that we can look at is Ephesians chapter 5. 
verses 22 to 33. As Paul writes about the marriage relationship as a picture of the relationship between Christ and His church, what does God want from marriage? I'm convinced that we see a great deal of that right here in this Scripture. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present to Himself in all her, the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we're members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Marriage is a picture of Christ in the church as we see in this text. And we see responsibilities on both sides as he talks about who is the husband supposed to be and how is he to behave and who is the wife to be and how is she to behave in this relationship. And he gives to the husband the command of unconditional love. A sacrificial love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Put her needs first. Be sacrificial. Do what's necessary to take care of her. That's a huge responsibility. In verse 28, he says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now there are some who look at that where it says, Well, the husband ought to do this. And they'll say, Well, you know, that's a good suggestion. It says ought. But the term that's translated from the Greek means an obligation. A requirement of what God expects of us men as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church, to be sacrificial in that, to do what's necessary to take care of our wives. But when we consider the other side of that, men, when we do what we're supposed to do and being sacrificial for and loving our wives in that way, it makes the other side of that much easier for wives to obey their part of it, which says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. There's a command, and we see also in verse 33, the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. As the husband is to give unconditional love, the wife is to be subject and to give an unconditional respect because of the God-given role in the way that God has designed marriage to work. And whenever both husband and wife take those roles seriously, whenever the husband loves his wife sacrificially, it makes submission much easier. And when the wife is submissive, it makes the unconditional and sacrificial type love much easier. God has designed his, uh, the marriage relationship to be a beautiful picture of the relationship between Christ and the church as He sacrificed Himself for us and we submit ourselves to Him. But as we consider the marriage relationship, this is something that God takes very seriously. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and I apologize, this one's not in the PowerPoint, but in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, God speaks, or, or Peter, he writes in speaking to husbands here, he says, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. And okay, so he gives a command here of how we're to relate to our wives, but notice the end of that verse. So that your prayers will not be hindered. How we conduct ourselves within the marriage relationship has an effect on our relationship with the Almighty. 
That's something for us to take very seriously and to consider, okay, how did God design this relationship to work? And how can I better be conformed to that? God has designed marriage to be a beautiful picture of Christ in the church, to be a lifelong relationship of two people who have made a covenant with one another. Be one man and one woman for life. To take care of one another. And as we look around and we see a culture, we see a society that speaks negatively about marriage, that has turned marriage into all kinds of abominations that it was never intended to be. I would suggest that our position on marriage should be that which we read in Scripture. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, it says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Our society speaks negatively of marriage. But when we look in God's Word, marriage is designed to be a great blessing. Our spouses are a great blessing to us. And it should be our goal as we look at that relationship to try to model ourselves after the relationship between Christ and the church and to fill our God-given roles within those. You know, as we get up in arms about what's going on in our society with marriage, but the first step for us needs to, needs to be that we make sure our own marriages are what they should be, that we treat our own marriages as holy, as something that was established by and that we were joined together by God. When people outside look at our marriages, they should see a picture of Christ and His church. They should see a picture of commitment and permanence. They should see two people who are willing to sacrifice for one another, who take care of each other, who love one another and respect one another. Two people who are committed to one another for life, in good times and bad, who are willing to forgive because in any kind of relationship, that's necessary at times. It should be a picture of Christ in the church. But as we consider that relationship, for those of us who are married, God has given us a specific design to follow. But as we consider, that's also the picture of Christ in the church, of a Savior who sacrificed Himself for us. If you're not a part of that, you have the opportunity to be a part of His church to submit yourself to a Savior that's given His life for you. To be, as we see in Scripture, to be a part of the bride of Christ, in which He's done everything, given up, paid the highest price, so that you can have freedom from sin, so that you can have hope of eternal life one day. You have the opportunity this morning, if you're not already, not already a Christian, to be married to Christ to be a part of His church. And that happens whenever you choose to turn away from sin, whenever you choose to repent, whenever you choose to be immersed in water and be united with Christ in those waters of baptism. This morning, if, if someone has a need, if you need the prayers of the church, if you need to recommit to Him, or if you need to become a part of the church that Jesus died for, you have that opportunity this morning if you'll come while we stand and while we sing.